What's going on guys? I want to welcome you back to another Q&A video. So everything is time stamped as usual. And with that said, let's get started. First question. What do you think of Mark Ripito saying that the box squad is for advanced lifters? You have a new novice program, so I'm a little confused. Okay, so first of all, the reason why I have it in my novice program is because a, it is a general strength program. It is not designed for powerlifting. I've made this very clear in the description of the system, okay? So if you're trying to be a competitive raw powerlifter, don't run my novice program. It's designed to give you a very strong foundation, particularly in the posterior chain, and of course, uh, make you injury-free, and all those types of good benefits. Like You can read the Q&A section. I talk about why I chose the box squat, okay? So it's not so you can become the best uh, raw free squat of all time. That said, uh, Mark Crypto, the reason why he's saying it's an advanced move is because he believes that you should train the free squat for many years first, really get proficient at the movement, compete without having to use box squats. Then maybe if you start uh, having plateaus, you can introduce them. And he likes to talk about Louis Simmons, who uses box squat on advanced athletes. But what he doesn't mention is that Louis has taken in guys that were like 14, 16 years old and built them from the bottom up through using exclusively uh, box squats. So no, in my opinion, uh, box squats are not for advanced lifters. They are for everybody. They're for beginners, intermediates, and advanced. Of course, you can argue that if you're trying to be a raw power lifter, it's probably in your best interest to learn the free squat first. And then once you start getting more advanced, you could do box squats and stuff. But uh, yeah, that, that's what he's referring to. He's talking about the powerlifting side of things. Because as a general strength movement, there's nothing advanced about a box squat. You're just sitting all the way back. You're loading posterior chain. If anything, it's better than a free squat for beginners because you're teaching proper technique. Most beginners bend at the fucking knees all the time. They don't use proper form. They don't shove like box squats is going to correct all those things. So, no, I think that it can be used for everybody regardless of experience levels. So, yeah, next question. Does your program work for tall people? I can't squat or bench for the life of me because of my long arms and legs. You have, you sure people have it lucky. Okay, I don't know which program you're talking about, my novice program or naturally enhanced. But at any rate, uh, I want to address your last comment, which, which was, uh, you sure people have it lucky. Uh, not really, man. You know, us short people have a really fucking hard time deadlifting. A very, very hard time. Our chance of injury is far higher than you, my man. And we have shittier leverages. I'm talking about on behalf of most short people. For me, when I do a deadlift, conventional anyway, my body's like a pen lay row. It's so bent forward that I could snap my fucking back in an instant, right? And I have terrible, terrible leverages for pulls. Whereas every tall guy that I've ever coached and trained in person, like been with, they all are proficient at deadlifts. So yeah, you do have an advantage. Also, tall guys have a better absolute strength foundation. Sure, your relative strength is not going to be as good as mine. I get that. Uh, you won't be able to compete with me at the same weight. So a tall 180 guy can't fuck with me. It is what it is. But uh, if you're a tall guy weighing 300 pounds, you're going to fuck everybody inside. You're also going to be uh, looking intimidating. So you have the looks factor going on. Your absolute strength is going to be good. I mean, there's a reason why most strongman competitors are tall, don't you think? And don't tell me that, oh, your limb length this, your limb length that. Please, bro. There's uh, raw powerlifting champions that are tall, that they're very good at the fucking, at the bench, the squat, and the deadlift, okay? Uh, usually, they, they excel at one lift or the other, like, it'll typically be like squat, deadlift for tall guys, but you can still be a great bencher if you're tall, if you have fucking long arms. I'm, I, look, if you're natural, I'm still sure that you could hit 315, even if you have long arms. So, don't worry about your fucking height, bro. So yeah, my program's gonna work for you. Uh, my knowledge program's gonna work, and natural enhancers especially gonna work. Because uh, there's not even a big emphasis on the big three. It's general strength, lots of rows, lots of shrugs. It's a lot of uh, posterior chain and yoke training in general. Which limb length is not really a huge factor. Actually, I would argue that being tall is a huge advantage for this type of training. Whereas I'm the one that kind of has problems here. So yeah, you're going to be fine uh, regardless of what system you use. Don't worry about it so much, man. Seriously. So yeah, next question. My incline 225 for 6, flat bench is 225 for 8. Do I have a problem? When I see people benching, they always use much higher weight on flat. Uh, yeah, you do have a fucking problem, man. That doesn't make any sense. You're incline pressing 225 for 6, flat benching the same weight for 8? I don't even know if that's possible. Like, if I... Dude, if I do a 225 for 8 incline, that's well in the very, very high 200s for the uh, flat bench. Maybe even the 300s. Like, I can't even fathom such a person being in existence. Like, 225 or 6 incline should translate to, like, over 275 and above flat bench. So, the only conclusion that I could draw, you're not doing half reps, so you're not touching your chest. B, you have a really fucking weird genetic uh, abnormality, like your anthropometry is fucked up, and you're really good at incline and overhead press. Or C, your pecs are really, 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 really weak. That's the only conclusion that I could come to, because... The incline should be way harder than your flat bench. It should be, there, should be, there should be a huge fucking gap between the two. Like if you're doing a 275 on the incline, your bench should be 
in the mid three uh, three hundreds for the most part, like three thirty five ish, uh, three forty five, maybe three fifty. Okay, so your ratio is all fucked up, bro. I suggest you do more chest work, uh, more flat benching, uh, more benching with a pause, camber bar bench, uh, weighted dips, maybe even do some flies, bro, because that ain't right. And I think it has to do with the chest development. Your chest is lagging. So yeah, man. Next question. Yo, Alex. I just wanted to know how do I do the rounded upper back deadlift properly? I find that once I go over ninety percent of my one rep max, my form starts breaking down. And it starts looking like scared cat form. Okay, so rounded back deadlifting. You have to understand that it's a very advanced technique. And if you haven't figured it out yet, then you're probably not advanced yet. Now, for me, I only started doing it recently because uh, I realized that it is the ultimate way to pull when you're lifting really heavy weight. You see, when I was doing the 400s and even the low 500s, I didn't have to worry about upper back grounding. I always kept everything tight and it was beautiful. But once I hit 585, uh, shit started getting serious. And I think now I understand why a lot of the top pullers who do conventional, they round their backs. Because it, it's, it's, it makes a huge fucking difference, dude. And for me, it just it naturally came to that type of style. I didn't have to force it. it. Just one day I was doing rack pulls and my upper back started rounding a bit more. And then as I got stronger at rack pulls, it started rounding more and more and more. Eventually, there was no scapular retraction whatsoever. And I feel that uh, doing rack pulls above the knee and even at the knee helped tremendously in learning how to use thoracic grounding. Because you can't round your lower back, obviously. Your, your body's upright. So you have no choice but to round the upper back. So that's the lift that I credit in teaching me thoracic grounding. Some people say it's a bad thing. Some people say that it's going to fuck up your posture. Uh, yeah, may, maybe my posture is a little bit more uh, kyphotic, if you will. But it helps me pull a lot more weight on my, my, my heavy deadlifts and stuff. So I would say this. If you're not advanced lifting, if you're not pulling at least like between 545 and 585, don't worry about the thoracic grounding. But if you are there, then uh, yeah, try doing rack pulls above the knee. Do it with stupid heavy weight. Eventually, your upper back is going to round. It's going to fucking round. There's no way around it. And that, that's when you'll be able to uh, teach yourself how to do it. All right? So good luck to you, sir. Next question. What do you think is better, doing a 3 rep max or a 1 rep max? Both are max attempts, so I asked. 1 rep max is far superior. It's called the max effort method. Look it up in Science and Practice of uh, Strength Training. Essentially, you produce maximum force when velocity is very low. Okay, it's the force velocity relationship of weights. So that's actually why isometrics is where you're demonstrating the most strength. There's zero velocity. See my point? So yeah, uh, one rep max, which is 100%, has the lowest possible velocity for a range of motion. And it's just, it's maxed out. It's going to recruit the max amount of muscle fibers, motor units, all that good shit. It's giving you more benefits than a three rep max. In fact, a three rep max is strength endurance. It's not maximum strength. Okay, you, there's, a, there's a big difference between hitting a triple. And doing a warmer max. Like you've, you've seen tons of guys who could, you know, they could hit 500 for three on a deadlift triple. But then you make them try to do 545 for one. They can't do it. Why? Because it's not directly correlated in that sense. I mean, it kind of is like if you have a strong three max, you're probably going to be good at warmer max. But the best way to get a, uh, really good at maxing out is to do maxing out. And there's nothing better in the world than the max effort method. If you're trying to get stupid fucking strong. It is proven. The max effort method, as Louis Simmons always talks about, is the greatest strength method of all time. So yeah, that's why in my programs, on my intensity days, I'm always uh, maxing out. I know I include and naturally enhance uh, the one to five rep max option, but I would highly, highly suggest that you do the one rep max version instead. So with that said, next question. Will three to five reps make you bigger also? Uh, absolutely. Why would three to five reps not make you gain muscle mass? Last I checked, Total workload is what counts, okay? And progressive overload over a long period of time is what helps. And also, no sane person would just do three to five reps. I'm assuming that if you're just doing that, you're probably running some minimalist bullshit program, which is going to get you injured and uh, give you a lot of plateaus in the long run. So if you're intelligent about your training, you should be doing some volume work of some sort. You should be periodizing your training in a sense, and you'll be doing reps above three to five, unless it's a Bulgarian light approach. And with that, you'll still gain muscle because... Uh, your the frequency is very high and you're accumulating a lot of workload over the weeks. So yeah, I'm gonna ask you the following question, man. Let's say right now you bench uh, 135 pounds, right? And I take that shit to 405 pounds, and I make you do exclusively three to five reps. Are you gonna tell me that your chest, uh, shoulders, and triceps are not gonna get bigger? So I, I want you to respond to me on that one. And with that said, let's move on to the next question. What part of the forms do you think contributes more to its appearance, the extensors or the flexors? I would have to say the flexors. I mean, I've thought about this for a long time. Trust me, I'm obsessed with forearm training, so I've examined both. And I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, it is the flexors. Like, every time you see a guy doing a double bicep, for instance, it's just going to be the flexors. If a guy flexes his forearms, 
this is it's gonna be the flexors for the most part. If you're just relaxing the front, assuming you don't have like super kyphotic posture and like fucking internal rotation, you're gonna see the flexors popping out. Look at the guys who specialize in flexor training and see what their forms look like. So arm wrestlers are the best demographic for this example. They flex, they're always in this position right here. All their curls, they do with a wrist like this. And wouldn't you know that their forms look fucking massive. So yeah, I think the flexors are more important. But I want to hear your feedback. What do you think is more important? So next question. Alex, say I was on the cusp of a six-plate bench and wanted to get there quick as possible. Would a month or two of Bulgarian light be good even though I love naturally enhanced and have been in on a few months? Or would I regret too much in lifts such as the rack pulls, which I also love? Yeah, the thing about Bulgarian lights is that you can't keep it all. And a great example is by looking at my man, Bulgar um, Eric Bugenhagen, right, from Metal Iron. Fucking love that channel. Huge shout out to him. So, yeah, Eric is always maxing out on a variety of different movements, right? Yet, when he returns to an exercise that he hasn't done in a long time, he regresses in strength. It's never actually consistent year-round. A great example would be the fact that, like, I think two or three months ago, we did an 800-pound trap bar deadlift. Yet his peak trap bar deadlift was 910 pounds. He also worked up to, I believe, a 785 Jefferson deadlift. Yet in the past, he's done 800. So every time you do Bulgarian light, something is going to go down. You're really specializing in one lift to the absolute max. So, yeah, if you want to take your bench to the next level and you want to use Bulgarian light as a temporary cycle, it's going to work. It's probably going to give you really fucking fast bench gains. But you could expect your rack pull to go down in strength because you're not doing your rack pulls unless, like... Unless you're still doing it somehow, like twice a week or some shit, uh, it's, it's going to go down. You know, but I'm assuming you're really going to push the Bulgarian light to limit like seven days a week benching or like five, seven days a week benching. And you're going to emphasize it like it should be, right? And also keep in mind that your work capacity is going to go down following that system as well because you're not, I mean, you're not having volume work in a sense. I mean, sure, the total weekly volume is high, but you're not doing high reps. So your fatigue tolerance is going to go down tremendously. So yeah, you are gonna, you're going to lose out on some of the naturally enhanced benefits. That's why if you saw my video, Concurrent Periodization versus Bulgarian Light, I do favor Concurrent. Because Concurrent, there is no setbacks. Everything is maintained year-round. It's just that maybe you won't make as fast gains in one lift compared to Bulgarian Light. And I think that's only common sense, right? If you do one fucking lift all the time, you're probably going to make fast strength gains on it. But what's the trade-off? The trade-off is that you lose general strength. So something to think about. So yeah, next question. What's your opinion on an eight-day split training, all body parts twice a week with one rest day? That doesn't really make sense. There's seven days in a week. How the fuck can you have one rest day and train eight days a week? You're going to have to do two days for the most part. And to me, that's just fucking madness. You're telling me you want to train eight days a week? So you can get two times a week muscle protein synthesis for a body part? What the fuck is that, bro? If I train full body twice a week, I'm going to get the same protein synthesis as you. Do you see? What the fuck? Seriously, that, that makes no sense, man. If you were to run a push-pull legs, that would probably be better for you. If, that, if, if you really like being in the gym that fucking often, man, and you want to split your training up, do a push-pull legs, which I don't usually recommend. And if you want an even better solution, which I think is fucking amazing, do upper-lower. Upper-lower is four times a week, right? You get to split up the upper body and lower body, and you get two times a week a muscle protein synthesis. So you're cutting your workout days by 50%. Because you, you want to train eight days a fucking week? Bro, are you kidding me? Do you, and also, you, you realize what it's going to do to your recovery following that shit? Your recovery is going to be fucked, man. Because the nervous system is the same. People don't think about this. But when you do body part splits, sure, it's a different muscle group. But still the same nervous system. It's not like you have a separate nervous system for your chest and your fucking legs. So if you're doing all these uh, sessions all the freaking time, it may be a different muscle group. But it's still the whole body. The body, the body is going to drain by you doing that. I guarantee you. So my advice is either push full legs, upper lower, or full body twice a week. Because eight day split sounds fucking crazy to me. I can't even fathom a program like that. Unless you're on large amounts of drugs, then be my guess. So that's that. Next question. How are we supposed to learn proper form on certain exercises if we're rotating every one to three weeks? For example, wouldn't it be a bad idea to do technical lifts like front squats and deadlifts if we're not practicing the movement because we're rotating so often? I assume you're talking about concurrent periodization or natural enhance. And for that, allow me to address your concerns. So, first and foremost, if you're a novice lifter, you're going to be milking the exercise for three weeks, okay? Uh, that's more than enough time to learn the movement. And on top of that, uh, when we talk about exercise rotation, you're not just rotating for the fuck of it. You're rotating movements that are very specific in nature. So, you might go from a wide grip bench to a close grip bench. You might go from a close grip bench to a close grip bench off low pins. You might go from a regular bench to a camber bar bench. You see my point? 
It's all specific shit. You might just rotate band tensions. You might just do close cabench with minis, close cabench with monsters, lights, then reverse band, maybe a one to two board press. So where are you losing technique? You're actually developing technique. And if you want, if you're, if you're really so concerned about that, then just use the dynamic effort method, which is a three week uh, pendulum wave. You can use it year round if you want. And you could always keep in that competition movement. Of course, it has bands included though. So if you want to maintain your benching form, just do three weeks with uh, the close cut bench with mini bands, then do another three weeks with monster mini bands, then go back and forth. Just alternate back and forth, but change like a bar or something. And you're going to be good. You're going to maintain your fucking technique. So no, I don't know what you're talking about, man. It sounds like you just don't have a lot of experience with concurrent periodization. And uh, yeah, that's just how it goes. And also, think about one final thing, right? If you're new to a lift, you're not going to rotate every week. So you, you have three weeks to test the lift. You have three weeks to develop it. That's a lot of time to develop technique. It really is. Trust me, it's a lot. Especially if you factor in the volume days. That equates to six uh, sessions where you're learning the movement. And you know what? Even if you haven't learned the movement, guess what? You're still going to make a skill and neural gains. So fuck it. It's actually a good thing that you're not fully adapting to it. It means that every time you introduce it back into your training, you're going to have fast uh, strength gains. So why not? What's the problem? So yeah, I hope that clarifies things, man. Next question. Do you retract the scapula on rack pulls? Okay, so I sort of asked this before, but I want to kind of re-say it again. So in short, when the weight gets super heavy, you will no longer be able to keep your lower, like your upper back tight. It's fucking impossible. It's just, it's literally impossible. Trust me, I know from experience, I'm the rack pull guy. I'm the guy who made them fucking popular on YouTube. I know rack pulls. I know fucking rack pulls. And I'm telling you for a fact that once you start lifting stupid heavy shit, your upper back's in a round. For me, it started rounding around the uh, 800 mark. After 800 pounds or so, I had to start rounding my shoulders forward. So it's just a nature. It's part of the movement, man. If you want to lift fucking max amounts of weight, really overload, you have to make sure your shoulders are like stretched out to the limit and rounded. You can't retract your scapula on a rack pull unless we're talking about uh, below the knee. But if it's uh, at the knee or above the knee, get ready for some thoracic rounding. So that's that. Next question. What are your thoughts on the reverse grip bench? Uh, the reverse grip bench press is an excellent tricep movement and it's also very safe on the shoulders because you have external rotation of the hands. So every time someone strains a shoulder from benching, it's because they were internally rotated. That's why uh, guillotine presses or super wide grip benching is typically avoided if you're trying to like rehabilitate your shoulder. So yeah, reverse grip bench, you're in this position right here and you're tucking the elbows all the way in. So this tucking action right here is going to involve a shitload of tricep, probably more tricep than a regular bench. It's also going to ensure that you are pressing in a straight vertical bar pass. So it's actually quite specific to geared benching. And if you look at Anthony Clark, who was one of the best reverse gear benchers of all time, uh, this is what he used to make his geared bench so strong. And I know some federations have gotten rid of it for this exact reason, given the fact that you could press it in a straight line. For some people, it does possess a, a mechanical advantage of about 50 pounds or so. And I think uh, currently Greg Knuckles is experimenting with the reverse gear bench. I believe he wants to surpass his regular with this style. So yeah, it's a great exercise, man. The only thing you got to be concerned about is do you have uh, safety pins? Are you doing it in the, be in the power rack? If not, then uh, don't fucking do the exercise. But if you're doing the power rack, you're pressing straight over your belly, right? You, you never have the bar over your face or your neck. Be my guess. I think it's a good movement. So that's that. Next question. I have been doing the same weight for three months. Is that bad? I want to add that I leave the gym with sore muscles and pump every day in these three months. I have noticed some gains, but are they newbie gains? I know the problem. You say you leave the gym every time pumped and sore muscles, you probably lack frequency, my man. You shouldn't be sore all the fucking time. If you're sore all the time, it means you're not hitting your muscles frequently enough. I'm going to bet that you're on a body part split. Or maybe, maybe if you're training twice a week, that is still not good enough for you. Maybe you need three times a week. And if it has nothing to do with that, then it simply means that your, 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 your tempo is too slow. You're doing too many slow negatives. That's why you're having all this fucking soreness. I have, I just, I have a feeling that... You're training like a bro. You said to yourself, you're, you're sore to the max and you have pumped up muscles. To me, that's an indicator of bro training. And bro training doesn't typically give you good strength gains. So I'm going to refer you to my video, uh, why most lifters have strength plateaus. I basically discuss the concept of uh, periodization and why this is what you need to do to get through your strength plateaus. And that's why you're not seeing the gains. You are not periodizing your training. Do you want to bet money on it? I'll bet money on it. I already, I know this to be true. I know I'm making a huge fucking assumption here. I could be totally wrong, but you said it yourself. You're pumped. You have sore muscles. To me, that is bro training. It's not uh, strength training. So get your ass on some periodized shit, man. Again, watch my video I made on it and good luck to you, sir. Next question. I have one inch width, two inches length chest gap. 
I'm a novice and I've been adding on decent chest size over the past year since I started weightlifting. Are there any key chest exercises or variations of exercise that I could do to fill in my inner pets as much as I can and make the gap less noticeable? If not, what are your thoughts on cosmetic surgery in the distant future to fill in the gap and make my chest more aesthetic? All right, sir, thank you for contacting me and allowing me to help you out. So I'm just going to spit some raw truth up in here. I'm going to keep things 100 fucking percent real. I'm going to be real, real, real with you. All right. So in regards to your last comment about cosmetic surgery, that's some bitch shit. That's some seriously bitch shit. You got to fucking slap yourself in the face right now. Seriously, I'm going to ask you right now. You, who, answered me, who asked this question, sit your ass down, slap yourself in the face, please. Just fucking slap yourself, man. Because why, why the fuck are you so concerned about a little chest gap? Do you know how fucking weak that sounds? Seriously, dude. That's fucking pathetic. I'm, I'm, dude, you, you want to know what my chest uh, gap is? The same as yours. I have a uh, one inch width, two inch length. I actually measured it after reading your comment. I didn't even know my chest gap was that fucking big. Uh, yeah, guess what? My chest is one of my best body parts, according to a lot of guys. And I tend to have a pretty aesthetic chest, if you will. I'm going to put a picture on the screen for you. Uh, does my chest look bad to you? Uh, not really, man. That's it, It's a good looking chest, if you ask me. And it took me years of fucking training to develop it. So I would stop worrying so much. Seriously, man. The, the, that Please, stop with that cosmetic shit. That's why there's so many fucking body image disorders. You want to have your square, round, connecting pecs and shit? Well, it ain't there. And you got to fucking deal with that shit. But please, I don't want to hear comments like that. Oh, should I get surgery? Should I get this? It makes me sad to hear comments like that. It really does. It's like asking me, should you do thin uh, synthol? It's the same fucking shit, dude. Please. Don't even think about cosmetic surgery, man. Please. Quit weights first before you even think about doing that shit. Real talk. Now, I even forgot your fucking question, man. Oh, yeah. How do you fill in? Comes with experience. Uh, my chest used to be like, it used to look a lot shittier when I was 120 pounds than what I am now. The gap looked a lot more pronounced, even though it hasn't changed at all. So just fill in your pecs as much as you can. You got to get much stronger. I'm going to suggest that you shoot for a uh, 315 for five pause bench, maybe 185 dips uh, for high reps, you know, uh, do your flies, do all that shit. Just raise the strength of your chest movements and it's going to develop over time. Now, keep in mind, there's no ways to, cha uh, to change your de uh, genetic shape. All you can do is make your chest bigger. And hopefully it'll fill out a little bit of the areas. But you're never actually going to correct the gap. The gap, I feel it. It's never going away no matter what I do. Unless I do cosmetic surgery, right? Which is fucking stupid. So yeah, stop worrying about it so much, man. Just get your chest as big as humanly possible. And deal with the consequences. That's and that, I'm, I'm not saying this to be an asshole to you, man. I'm saying this because I care. Sometimes we need a bit of a mind awakening, if you will. To get your, your, your shit straight. For real. So good luck, man. Next question. Alex, what bands would you recommend for someone who wants to get into using bands in their training? Also, what bands would be good for bench, squat, and deadlift? Okay, I'm going to recommend the following. 41 inches in length, mini bands, and monster mini bands. And if you want the specs for these bands, go on the Elite FTFs website or Rogue Fitness and see what the widths are, right? So once you know what that thickness is, you can go on Amazon or eBay and you can find similar bands for a cheaper price if that's what you want to do. Or you could just get the brand name. It doesn't really matter. So what you want is 41 inches in length, mini bands, and monster mini bands. Now, in terms of what's best for squat, bench, deadlift, uh, they're pretty much like squat and bench is the same. Mini band, monster mini band, and light. For deadlifts, though, you're going to need a lot uh, more band tension. And in particular, I'm going to recommend that you get short bands. So get some strong bands, get some average bands, get some lights. The monster minis and the minis may not be necessary for this purpose unless you have a deadlift platform and you plan on quadrupling that shit. So that's my advice for bands. Next question. How to properly implement band cycles. Louis Simmons recommends three-week dynamic cycles, but I haven't seen an in-depth discussion of how much band tension as percent of total load, etc. Uh, Louis Simmons has talked about this a lot of fucking times, dude. So I suggest you look more into his work. But uh, I'll try to sum up what he says. Essentially, if you look at qualified weightlifters, over 700 qualified weightlifters overseas, uh, most of the training was done in the 75, 80, 85% range, right? Now, therefore, dynamic effort training should be done in that range, right? Well, guess what? Louis Simmons took this concept to the next level by still getting those percentages, but by using bands instead. So he would do 25% band tension with 50, 55, 60%, which equates to 75, 80, 85 at the top. So you accommodate resistance, you get all the benefits of bands, which I made a video on, you can check it out. Uh, but now you're also, you're working in the 
uh, ranges that Olympic weightlifters worked in. So you're going to get the maximum speed strength benefits. So that's kind of how it goes like. You want 25% band tension and you want to end up in the range of 75, 80, 85. All right, that's, that's what Louis Simmons recommends. Now in terms of how to implement it, again, it's a three-week uh, pendulum wave. So you might do 50, 55, 60 with mini bands. And then week four, you, have, you repeat the cycle with a different barbell or like a different movement. Or you switch over to a different band tension. But now you got to um, lower the percentages of your straight weight to match the band tension. And usually, like for monster minis, you got to subtract like uh, 5, 10 points off the original amount. So yeah, I'm, I'm just giving you a listen. I'm just giving you some surface level knowledge here. I don't want to get too much into detail. Louis has talked about this so many times. Like, don't even listen to me, man. Just go to the source directly. Just for real, dude. So that's that next question. How can I get better at arm wrestling? Uh, if you want to become better at arm wrestling, number one, you got to do more arm wrestling. That's a giver right there. So I recommend the table practice. Get yourself a training partner or sign up to an arm wrestling gym or whatever and start practicing because you can't just uh, do training in the gym and expect to become the best arm wrestler. Uh, in fact, most of my arm wrestling training was not even weight training at all. It was just sparring with guys. I started arm wrestling at about 12 years old and uh, it was a great thing. I really liked it and I would fucking wreck guys. In fact, when I was in high school, there were guys who were much more buff than me, much, yet I fucking wrecked them at arm wrestling. And guys who went to school with me can attest to what I'm saying here. I have tons of fucking witnesses. I was a skinny guy, like 120 pounds, but I would wreck dudes that were 180, 200, sometimes even more than that. Even when I went to uh, college, there were guys who were fucking steroid monsters, 240 pounds. I would wreck their ass. Why? Because I had lots of arm wrestling experience. I started doing this shit at 12 years old. And if you look at some of the uh, good arm wrestlers, a lot of them are not as big as you think. Look at Devin Lorette, okay? He fucking smoked the mountain, even though the mountain is twice the size. Uh, look at John Brzezink, one of the best arm wrestlers of all time. Again, he's not as big as you think. It's just, uh, it is what it is. Like, if you want to become a better arm wrestler, you got to do a fuckload of arm wrestling training. I think that's, like, super, super key. Because it's also, like, it's, it's isometric strength. You're, you're building isometric strength every single time, you know? So... Uh, yeah, you definitely want to do a lot of arm wrestling, and of course, you want to supplement it with uh, weight training. Now, the weight training has got to be specific. Uh, if you want information on that, check out the interview I did with uh, Raymond Cody, the creator of the Country Crush. He gives a lot of good advice for arm wrestling training, so I think you're really going to enjoy uh, that particular discussion. So that's that. Next question. What do you think of guys with long hair? Does this take away from the bear mode look? Uh, thing is, long hair is going to hide your traps and upper back. So it, it kind of, it might take away from the bare mode look to a certain extent. Like, I believe that if you go bald or you go short on the sides but, like, longer on top, it's going to make you look way more yoked. It, it just, it is what it is. Because long hair covers the fucking yoke muscles. It also creates a lot of uh, darkness. Like, if, if you look at a, a chick, right, look at the sexiest women. At least, I'm talking, like, in my experience, right? I find that the sexiest women are the ones that have long hair. Why? Because it makes them look less like a man. It gives them, it, it accentuates the feminine areas in a sense. It, it, it removes the upper back and the traps out of the equation. It just, it has this effect on the body. I can't explain it. I'm not, I'm not a fucking professional in what I'm saying here. But I know that a woman with long hair, they look more fucking feminine. I don't know, I don't know how to explain. Maybe it's my social conditioning, but it does something to the proportions. Look when a chick ties up her hair, right? See what it does to the body. Then make her lengthen it out, see what it does. So I think that you'll have a similar effect if you're a man. The shorter your hair is, and again, you can do it yourself. If you have long hair, like down to your fucking nipples, shave it off. See what it does to your yoke. I have found that for most men, it's going to make you look a lot more buff. And I'm just speaking off experience here. So yeah, you can still have long hair and be bare mode. I'm not saying that you can't, but I just believe that it's going to make your yoke look a little bit small. So that's just my take on it. Next question. Does anyone know if minoxidil will work for a slight receding hairline? Okay, I got this question a lot of fucking times, and I need to address it because people... Look, people don't want to read the comment section, even though I responded all the freaking time. In short, minoxidil for head hair, right, is, is only temporary because you have male pattern baldness. So DHT is going to come in and fucking wreck all your shit. So whether the hairs are terminal or not, doesn't really matter. You're going to lose it if you stop using the minoxidil. Whereas for beard growth... You don't have male pattern baldness. There's no male pattern baldness for the beard. It does not happen. If that were true, then guys who are balding on their heads would also bald on their beards. But in fact, what we tend to see is that bald guys usually have gray beards because their head is more sensitive to DHT. You see? So, but guess what? If your face is sensitive to DHT, 
you only grow hair. You don't have the male pattern baldness effect. So yeah, yeah you, if you use it on your beard, the gains are permanent once the vellus hair has become terminal. But for head hair, you got to keep using the shit. And that's why, like, I'm, I'm going to be on this Minoxo for about a year. Then I'm getting the fuck off. It's just going to stay forever. So that's that. Next question. Would you ever attend the Body Power Expo in the UK? Maybe I would. Like, uh, honestly, man, you guys from the UK fucking love your ass. You guys are my second most popular demographic. Are you aware? First would be the United States. Second is UK. Third is Canada. So you guys from the UK are representing more than my own population, which is the Canadians. So much love to you. I fucking, I love British people. I don't know what to say. I love their accent. I love their way of living. I mean, huge shout out to you guys from the UK. You guys are fucking amazing. So yeah, uh, maybe I would go to the Body Power Expo, but I'd have to be in the London area. I'm not taking a plane trip just to go to an expo for the fuck of it. There has to be other motives for me to go to UK. All right. So if I have other motives, like maybe I'm going to have a seminar or some shit there. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll go to the Body Power Expo at the same time. But otherwise, uh, I don't really plan on going in. So that's that. Last question of the week. Alex, do you recommend above the knee rack pulls while sitting on the shitter? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, so that's it for this uh, Q&A video. Hope you enjoyed it. Give me more questions down below, and I will talk to you all next time.